I can tell you how you're going to die. Odds are it's from one of these ten things. On this list of ten, dementia and Alzheimer's comes in at number three. Dementia and Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's is a disease which deteriorates your brain. One in four Australians over the age of 85 have Alzheimer's. Every 67 seconds, someone in the US is diagnosed with Alzheimer's. If you have a proclivity to have Alzheimer's, your only chance is for technology innovation to, to come up with a cure. Because today, out of that top 10 list, it's the only one without a way to slow it, prevent it, or stop it. So this is poignant for me because my great auntie, Susie, she died of Alzheimer's just a month ago. And before her, my grandfather died of Alzheimer's a couple of years back. So for me, finding a cure for Alzheimer's in my lifetime is really important. And for that, I am cheering on advancements in technology. I am relying on it. And I'm sure that for each of you, you have your own personal reasons why you would want technology to advance, but Alzheimer's is mine. So the good news is that technology is definitely advancing. We know that. But the bad news is that as technology advances, it gives birth to a whole other issue, one that not many of us have given much thought to. And that's the challenge that computers will become smarter than us humans. We call that a human level of artificial intelligence. And when computers are smarter than humans and can perform better than us in all sorts of ways, we call that superintelligence. And for folks that know a bit about superintelligence, they call it the last invention we'll ever make and the last challenge we'll ever face. Stephen Hawking said that. So how likely is it that we're going to hit this level of human level artificial intelligence? It's a pretty high bar, right? Like, we're humans and our brains are pretty sophisticated. Well, it's a factor of two main things. Advances in hardware and advances in software. So let's have a look at how hardware's going. So since the 60s, a guy called Gordon Moore predicted that for the same price, every 12 months, computing power would double. And that's held true for the last 50 years. The impact of this law on us is that I have more computing power in my hand right now than this supercomputer of the 1980s called Deep Blue. And it's not just hardware that's getting more powerful. Software is actually doing this double team where it's making the hardware even more powerful. So software is advancing to a point where you can use a computer game today, and this is an image of Kevin Spacey. And it's hard to tell the difference between a computer animated version of Kevin Spacey and the real life video image, yet one's a game. And so, the advancements in software and hardware mean that the, uh, the artificial intelligence that's available to me today in this mobile phone is fast advancing to become at a human level of artificial intelligence. And the interesting thing here is that it's going to happen faster than we expect. And why is that? Well, as humans, we think linearly quite easily. So if you take 30 steps linearly, you get to 30, one, two, three, four. But if you take 30 steps exponentially, like doubling each step, you get to over a billion. And Moore's law is telling us that technology is doubling every 12 months. So we're on this exponential curve. So if we're on this exponential curve, when's that magic moment where computer intelligence overtakes human intelligence? Well, you get a bunch of experts together and their average prediction is that that magic date is somewhere around 2040. So that's only 25 years from now. 
And the point at which we might hit super intelligence, well, their average prediction for that is 2060. My view is that even if it takes twice as long, it's going to happen in yours and my lifetime. This is a thing for our generation. And when the time comes that a computer is smarter than the human brain, we're going to look back on the human brain as if it's some sort of low-powered, low-memory, retro computer system like this one. And that's kind of hard to get your head around. But if you think about it, the human brain doesn't really stand that much of a chance because the human brain's trapped in our head. It's stuck in a, a physical container and it's difficult to expand the size of it. Unlike with a computer, you can add memory to it, add computing power to it, upgrade it. You can easily reproduce a computer, whereas many of you parents in the room will know the sort of investment you need to make to reproduce the human brain. Probably the most powerful piece that a human brain can't compete against is a, thing, a concept called collective intelligence. And that's when you string a bunch of computers together and a little bit of information that's somewhere in the corner of the computer network is able to be scanned and brought into the, the knowledge base of the whole computer system. And no matter how much we munge our heads together or sit close to each other, we can't do that with our human brains. It's difficult for me to read the mind of someone in the back row of this auditorium. Let me give you an example of how powerful this concept of collective intelligence is. So those folks that were working on that supercomputer back in the 80s, Deep Blue, well, pretty quickly after then, they, they focused their energy on creating an artificial intelligent computer. And so to test themselves, four years ago, they pitted that artificial intelligence against the best humans at a general knowledge game on TV. And guess what? The computer won. So why did it win? Because it was able to process over 200 million pages worth of information, including the full text of Wikipedia, in less than three seconds. Now, that's a pretty powerful thing to contend with, right? So, so what sort of future might we have if we're contending against such powerful computers? Well, it could be awesome. So from my perspective, I need a cure for Alzheimer's in my lifetime, or else I'm likely to hit, get hit by number three there, right? So for me, it could be awesome. Superintelligence could create some sort of nanotechnology that goes into my bloodstream and clears up all those decayed cells in my brain, maybe makes me smarter, better looking, grow a little bit more hair, whatever. But um, not just inside of my body, like generationally and environmentally could make a massive difference. For example, superintelligence could create carbon scrubbing technology that cleans our air and environment from greenhouse gas emissions and carbon dioxide and solves environment, big environmental issues, as well as the top 10 diseases. So it could be awesome for us. But it also could be apocalyptically bad. So imagine if superintelligence decided that it didn't want or need to share this planet with us, or it wanted to save us from ourselves and wipe us out. So these are pretty bad outcomes. And in the, in the context of human history, we haven't had many technology advances that have posed what's called an existential threat on us, a threat that we could be wiped out. But this is one of them. And that's why Stephen Hawking says it could be the last invention that we'll ever make and the last challenge that we'll ever face. But we're at this great point in time right now where a human level of artificial intelligence is still 25 years away. So we can do something about it. And my point of view is that folks like you and me can create guidelines and start to develop the pathway forward to make sure that we get to a great outcome rather than a bad outcome. So what do I mean by guidelines? Well, I was particularly inspired by Isaac Asimov, 
who thought of a set of guidelines back in the 40s, before there was even robots or artificial intelligence. And he developed these three laws of robotics. The first law was that a robot may not injure a human being or through inaction allow a human being to come to harm. Now that's a pretty nice little guideline, right? So let's think about an example that's even closer to, close to us than the 1940s. In the 70s, there was advances in biotechnology. For the first time, we were able to recombine DNA. And this was a pretty dangerous thing because we could have created all sorts of mutations and viruses. And a bunch of folks just like you and me got together at a place called Asilomar and they developed guidelines for how to use biotechnology in a safe way. And since then, we've had all the benefits of the biotechnology revolution and none of the detriments. And that proved to us that, that guidelines are a good place to start. Now, I don't know about you, but I feel a bit nervous that we're currently heading towards a human level of artificial intelligence and we don't have any guidelines in place. And in fact, each of us in our own way are actually helping to advance technology. So for me, I spend my days developing software apps and I enjoy that. But all of, all of us, when we search the internet or we send off a tweet, we're actually creating and curating the fact base for superintelligence. So my point is that if we start to manage this, we can make sure that it doesn't become unmanageable. Thank you.